welcome to What the Fuck Just Happened. I'm your host, Liz Enton. If you listen to the intro, you know my story. If not, here's a brief summary. I'm a science skeptic, and when my dad died, I took a shot in the dark and decided to investigate if there was any possible evidence of an afterlife. I assumed that was as realistic as Santa Claus, but I was desperate. However, I was so blown away by what I discovered that I wrote a book and launched this podcast. In this podcast, I will be talking to some fairly normal people about some really weird shit. I speak with everyone from psychic mediums and afterlife researchers to ordinary people who've had some inexplicable experiences. So come, listen, there's no need to draw any final conclusions. Keep an open mind and wonder, what the fuck just happened? I just want to let everyone know a little bit about the guest I have on today. His name is Dr. Stanley Krippner, and he is a parapsychologist. He has a huge body of very significant work in parapsychology, psi. He's done intensive and very in-depth research and studies on dreams, dream telepathy, a port, which is when an object seems to appear out of nowhere, possibly manifested psychically. We'll go into that a little more in this episode. And he was born in 1932. I'm going to read you his biography on Sci Encyclopedia. Stanley Krippner is an American psychologist and parapsychologist known for his research in dream ESP, altered states of consciousness, and shamanism. He is the author, co-author, and editor of many books and articles on parapsychology and other topics, including Debating Psychic Experience, Varieties of Anomalous Experience, and the Multi-Volume Advances in Parapsychological Research. He also has a new book, which is his memoir, coming out soon, A Chaotic Life, The Memoirs of Stanley Krippner, Pioneering Humanistic Psychologist. And I will let all of you know when his book comes out. So today I have a classic parapsychologist I'm just thrilled to have on, Dr. Stanley Krippner. Thank you for the lovely entry point, and I'm happy to greet all of your listeners and viewers, yes. Wonderful. So I am so curious. Please tell us what got you into parapsychology in the first place? I would say curiosity. In my childhood, I had a few unusual experiences. And when I entered the university, I found out that there was a scientific way of investigating these experiences. And that appealed to me much more than trying to attribute them to some sort of religious dogma or some sort of psychological, pathological explanation. And so I took the opportunity to get a good grounding in psychology so that I could be investigating this and other areas from a science-based platform. And I know I've heard you mention that you had one really fascinating kind of psychic experience yourself as a child, which not all researchers do. Would you mind sharing that with our listeners? Oh, not at all. And I'll tell your viewers, it will be covered in greater detail in my autobiographical book, A Chaotic Life, to be published by University Professors Press. Now, to get back to your question, when I was about 13 or 14 years of age, I was very despondent because a relative was selling the World Book Encyclopedia, and I wanted my parents to buy one. We were lived on a farm, 
they didn't have the money to spend, which in those days was $100, a lot of money. And so I was very despondent. And I was thinking, do I have any rich friends or relatives that can loan me the money? So I said, yes, I have my uncle Max Bunsen, who is a very, very successful executor of dairy products. And then there was a scream. And I went downstairs and asked my mother, what happened? Your uncle Max just died. So that was a very dramatic example of what today is called extrasensory perception or ESP. And that triggered my interest in the field. You've had just a whole wealth of experience in this field that would be so helpful to our viewers and listeners. One, I know you've done some studies on apports and what is your experience with apports? What are some remarkable ones you've seen? So just explaining apports, those are this phenomena when an object appears seemingly out of nowhere and it seems to be the thought is it's signs from the other side. There have been apports that have been reported to show up in seances. If you read my book, you read about how there seemed to be an apport of a special feather sign from my dad that was inexplicable. Actually, my experience with apports not only appears in my memoirs, but also in the magazine of the British Society for Psychical Research, where I detail every one of the airports that apparently came out of no place during my trips to Brazil, working with a remarkable psychic by the name of Amir Amadin. And just to give you one example, on my third visit with him, he got out of the automobile and I said, Amir, just hold it because I want to take a photograph of you before we get down to work. And he said, fine. And I clicked my camera and the flash went off. And as soon as the flash went off, a coin dropped out of no place at my feet. It was a commemorative French coin with the image of Joan of Arc, something just recently released. So I added that to my collection of airports all of which are now at the University of Manitoba in Canada, which has an entire library collection of airports from all over the place. And we hope that someday the money will be available for a technician or engineer to study the airports to see if they have anything in common. So that is one among many airports. And I don't think anybody could come up with a convincing explanation of how the Joan of Arc coin fell out of no place if a mirror tossed it in the air, it would have been caught by the camera and also several observers, but that is a possibility. Let's go back to another experience with Amir. I was working with him with a psychologist friend and my psychologist friend, Amir, my daughter is wondering if you can produce something for her 14th birthday. And immediately a ring dropped out of no place with 14 little rhinestones decorating it. And of course, his daughter, several hours later, was delighted. And thank heavens, I was able to observe it, as were several other people. So the only viable explanation for this is that we're all lying. This is a conspiracy. We made it all up for publicity. Or there is a third possibility. Like this is something I urge many people to do. Simply they say, well, this is very interesting, and I'll remember this in case I run into something similar that could shed light on it. So there you are. So I'm just interrupting a second to explain a little bit more about Amir Amadin. So according to Sci Encyclopedia, he is a Brazilian physical medium known for the appearance near him of a ports. The phenomenon was investigated in 1994 by a team of researchers led by Stanley Krippner. 
on whose report this article is based. So the full article is in Science Encyclopedia, and I'll link to it in the show notes. And I just wanted everyone to know and learn a little bit more about the level that Dr. Krippner has done on his research of Amir Ahmedin. Is all just makes you question your whole definition of reality. And I know you did a lot of dream research on ESP at Maimonides. What were some of the studies that stood out to you there that really you feel demonstrated ESP or the inexplicable? Well, every one of those experiments is discussed in our book, Dream Telepathy, which just came out in a 50th anniversary edition, much to my delight that's still hanging around that Matthew Ullman and I wrote many, many years ago. So every one of those experiments was interesting in its own way. And to give you an example, before we did an experiment, I volunteered myself for any bugs or confusions, I would spot it before we did the ordinary study. So I went into the sleep room And when they saw the rapid eye movements on the EEG, they woke me up and asked for my dream. And I said, yes, in this dream, I'm standing at the end of a precipice looking down into a valley, and I'm hoping that I do not fall in. All right, that was an interesting dream. And the next morning, they showed me eight different pictures and asked which picture was similar to my dream. And of course, the people showing me the pictures had no idea what the dream was, so there could be no cues. Now, I saw one picture, which was very, very similar to my dream, because it shows a cliff over something that looks like the Grand Canyon, a very beautiful vista. So the cliff was pretty much a direct match to what I dreamed about, even though my dream was not as colorful as the photograph. So there's just one of many examples. Also, I should mention that sometimes the dream has no relevance to a dreamer's personal life, and sometimes it does. Now, one of our subjects was an artist, and he dreamed about going to Madison Square Garden to get tickets for a boxing match. Now, this is interesting because He had never been to a boxing match in his waking life, never was interested in boxing, yet there he was at Madison Square Garden buying a ticket. Well, again, the next morning, he was shown a large number of pictures, about eight of them, and one of the pictures was by the artist Saul Bellows. It shows two guys boxing each other, and the name of the painting is both members of this club. And that was pretty much a direct match for what our artist friend was dreaming about. Now, I don't want to mislead mislead anybody because not all of the connections were that obvious and not all of the connections were matches. So this is why one needs to collect a fairly large number of these nights of dreams so that one can do statistics with them and figure out whether the misses are outnumbered by the hits at statistically significant levels. And what has been the conclusion? Well, the conclusion was actually published in the International Journal of Dream Research a few years ago, and they found exactly 50 dream ESP experiments, not only in our laboratory, but other laboratories, and the Authors who are psychologists with a good command of experimental methods said the dream ESP experiments were repeated more often than not, and they were repeated at a rate very similar to what other experiments are repeated in mainstream psychology. So anybody who wants to know about the dream ESP experiments and their impact simply has to go to that journal article, and it will answer all their questions. Is there a study you've participated in or phenomenon you witnessed that you just find 
the most mind blowing, the most evidential that there's something more than materialism? First of all, it depends upon how you define materialism. And materialism is different than physicalism, but let's not spend time on that. The participant who we worked with more extensively at my mother's medical center in our dream laboratory was William Irwin, who was actually a New York psychoanalyst, had good dream recall. He came in for one eight night study and he was quite successful in dreaming about the distant art print. And then we came back for a second study. He did equally well. And we did an analysis of each of the nights that he had a hit rather than a miss. And those were the nights in which the geomagnetic activity was low. In other words, not much sunspot activity, not many electrical storms. So the physical environment was very conducive. Remember I told you about Amir Ahmadin and how the flash went off when the airport fell down and airports don't always follow those circumstances. But in this case, it was an electrical flash that tied into the airport. And in Dr. Irwin's case, it was the geomagnetic activity that corresponded. So there is something in the atmosphere, something in the total environment that seems to be necessary in addition to the rigor of the experiment the motivation of the participant, et cetera. One has to see these events in a larger setting because in nature, there are no dividing lines. Everything happens all at once, as the movie says. You've also witnessed or investigated psychic surgery, energy healings. I, what are your thoughts on that? What have you seen and what have you concluded? Well, you know, this is a very tricky area. And I really have not conducted any research on that topic. I simply have a number of observations and personal experiences. And there are other studies, other people who have the time and energy and knowledge to spend more time on it than I do. But here's the bottom line. Yes, you can go to a psychic healer, but do this in conjunction with the medical treatment that you're getting and use the psychic healing as sort of a backup. It certainly doesn't do anybody any harm. But if somebody said, I want to go to a psychic healer, I have a life-threatening disease. And I say, well, you can go to the healer as a last resort. Try everything that you can do in both conventional and unconventional medicine first, because ESP and other psychic qualities are not predictable. You never know when they're going to work, when they're not going to work. And many people, of course, say that they're not going to work at all. So that's my advice to people. And I have seen many people who have very, very dramatic examples of psychic healing that take place. And I wish I could say the same. The closest that I came to something remarkable was when I was in Brazil and a psychic healer was working on me, and I had a bandage on my shoulder because of a insect bite that I received. And after she finished working with me, we took the bandage off, and it was covered with all sorts of yellowish goo. She said, that's ectoplasm. Well, there, there you are. All I can say is by my wound healed up, maybe because of her treatment, maybe because of the passage of time, but it certainly doesn't do me any harm. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, this all this stuff's just so interesting. And I know this is a little bit speculative, but how much do you think all the research ties into survival of consciousness? Do you think survival is possible or probable? Well, you know, I always look at the evidence for claims. And there is so much evidence on survival that I really don't doubt it much at all. The American Psychological Association, of which I'm a longtime member, has a publishing company, and they 
just published a book called Death is an Altered State of Consciousness by Iman Burris, a very good psychologist and a friend of mine. And he takes up all of the pieces of survival research, such as past life memories, such as mediumship, such as deceased people occurring in dreams, et cetera, et cetera. And he says the net total of the evidence certainly is strongly conducive to the existence of life after death. Now, the fact that the American Psychological Association published this means that it had to go through several reviews and several editors to get permission, especially given the controversial nature of the book. Also, on another front, the Bigelow Foundation for the Study of Consciousness had a contest a while back, and they ended up giving a million and a half dollars of prizes to people who presented the best collection of evidences supporting life after death. All the prize-winning essays are on their website, by the way, so anybody can read them. And I'm just waiting for somebody to find flaws with the research. So far, I haven't seen anything. But again, the evidence is easily available, not only in the Bigelow Institute collection and the Emont Burris book on death as an altered state of the consciousness, but the files of groups like the British Society for Psychical Research that go back over a century or more where they painstakingly collected anecdotal reports and incidences that seem to support the existence of survival. So the data is there. People can read it, make their own judgment. And I know there is so much strong evidence of survival, of psi, of consciousness behaving non-locally, but there are groups of skeptics, scientists who completely dismiss all of this. And I know that over the years, you've had some good relationships with skeptics who've dismissed this. I'm just curious, first of all, what are your thoughts on why so much of this evidence is dismissed? Well, frankly, when it comes to controversial topics, many people give a knee-jerk reaction to say, well, that can't possibly be the case. I'm not even going to bother reading about that. And I think that outside criticism can be very, very valuable. And that is why I have had good relationships with some of the folks that you describe as skeptics, because I think that we can learn from some of the justifiable criticism. Now, when it comes to criticism that's not justifiable, all we can do is to make a reasoned response and hope people will read it. The example that comes immediately to mind is my conversations with Ray Hyman, who's retired professor of psychology at Oregon State University. And he wrote some very, very good critical pieces about parapsychological experiments. And the two of us have been in touch both personally and on email. And I think that a lot of his criticism is very, very valid. And he certainly is open to dialogue with parapsychologists. So that is the way that science proceeds with dialogue and repeatable experiments and the like. Very different from what another group of so-called skeptics say, when they say, well, there's no sense reading this material because those events simply could not happen. The physical laws of the universe rule out this from happening. Now, how do you respond to something like that? But in the first place, there are people who have been analyzing these results who come from a very conservative point of view and they say, well, there's nothing in the laws of physics that can rule out ESP and psychokinesis. In fact, there are ways of interpreting quantum physics to see how it provides an opening for such action at a distance. So there you have a contrast between James Alcock, who made the statement in 
the American Psychologist, the flagship journal of the American Psychological Association, in response to Etzel Cardenia's long article in the same journal, where he found seven data sets on parapsychology that support the existence of extrasensory perception and psychokinesis. Psychokinesis, that is mind's ability to affect matter, such as spoon bending or a mind's ability to move objects. So it's hard to do dialogue, maybe impossible to do dialogue, with somebody whose mind is completely shut. And you said you know, Ray Hyman made some very valid criticisms. What would you say were some of the most valid criticisms that helped advance parapsychology? I think that you know, one of the most valid criticisms is that we don't have a exploratory mechanism. And this was true many years ago, but now there are, as I mentioned earlier, several schools of thought that propose the way that psychic phenomena exist, and they do not violate the laws of physics at all. In fact, they can be explained by some of the advances in, in quantum. So I think that is a valid criticism, and it will remain until some of the theoretical explanations can be experimentally tested. And that, of course, requires money, which parapsychologists do not have much of. I think that back in the early days of this research, there were some valid criticisms that were taken into account by parapsychologists. And none of this would be possible had there not been a dialogue. And the dialogue between people with opposing interpretations of the parapsychological literature are very valid. This is sort of moves things forward. And you mentioned advances in physics, and you've been studying this in depth for a while. If you could guess, this is speculative, but how would you think this all works scientifically? Survival of consciousness, ESP, what would be your best guess? Well, I'm not a theoretician, so I'll have to give a very simple explanation of that. My feeling is that what we call consciousness is actually the basis of the whole universe. We've been assuming for years that the brain produces consciousness. And now some people, including myself, are arguing, no, consciousness is fundamental. Consciousness produces the brain and everything else that we interact with. And the consciousness is all pervasive, which means that it can show up in some unexpected places. And when the atmospheric conditions are right and the motivation is right, there can be an example of what we call psychic phenomena. And this comes from what many people have called the ground of being, rather than being isolated from the ground of being. So I know it's a stretch, but if one can consider consciousness as fundamental to the universe, then one will not be surprised by synchronicities, precognitive dreams, high scores on randomly thrown dice or other physical objects. All of that is possible when one considers consciousness as being fundamental. Now, I'll also add their indications that this fundamental consciousness being is imbued with love. It's love that, as the song goes, makes the world go round and also makes the universe go round. Love is a part of cohesion, of interaction, of closeness. And this is why emotion seems to be so very, very important in the production of psychic phenomena, and especially some type of positive emotions, such as affiliations with people who are involved in the experiment or loved ones who are alerted when a member of the family is a distance is sick or dying. And again, there are people who have written about this in much greater detail than I could ever do. But that would be my quick reaction to your question. And I want to talk a little bit about more about you and your story, because I know your memoir is coming out, A Chaotic Life, The Memoirs of Stanley Krippner, Pioneering Humanistic Psychologist. So tell us, that follows your 
life trajectory. Give us a little bit of what's one of the most exciting moments in the book or experiments that you cover. Well, I, you talk about, we're talking about dream telepathy, et cetera. I give this interesting story about a medical student who came to the laboratory for testing. His name was James Unger. He's now a practicing physician. And he had been doing a correspondence course with the Rosicrucian or Institute, which is, has a beautiful headquarters in San Jose, California, built to resemble an Egyptian temple. And his correspondence courses involved, among other things, going out of one's body. And he wanted to have that test out. We said we'd be delighted. So we scheduled him for four different nights. And each night, one staff member would randomly select a picture, again, from a large collection. But it was in a sealed envelope. And the assistant would go to the sleep room and shape the picture into a ledge on top of the bed without looking at it. So the only way for James Unger to see the picture would be through clairvoyance or what he considered an out-of-body experience where he could go and look in the shelf. And the first three nights, he simply was unable to project. But on the fourth, he woke up and said, I was just out of my body and I returned. And the picture is a picture of a beautiful sunset. So remember that it's not enough that he gives a verbal report. He has to choose the picture from a whole series of pictures. And he chose the right picture. It was a picture called Memories of a Perfect Sunset. So that was quite remarkable. Yeah. Now, again, did he really go out of his body or was he using his clairvoyance or ESP or precognition predicting what the picture would turn up? Well, <laughs> of course, we don't know. And again, remember that nature does not make these divisions. Humans make this division. So whatever happened, he made a remarkable hit. And I describe it, yes, in my memoirs. And of course, it was published elsewhere as well. But when people read your book, they can get all the full details on this, as well as so much remarkable research. Has your view of reality and what's possible versus impossible, has it transformed? over the years? No, I would not say it's transformed. It's just been enriched. At a very young age, I realized that different people have different realities. Certainly, some of the people that I talked with, especially on political international events, had a completely different view of reality than I did. And I realized that their view of reality, as was mine, was conditioned from their past experiences, sometimes even from their ethnic background. So one could see how they saw the world differently than I did. So how do you resolve this? And again, due to religious dogma, which doesn't cut it for me, or you can simply dismiss it and say, too complicated for me to worry about, which I can understand. Or you can try in investigating using the tools of science. And this is what I would have been happy to do. What are you most excited about, about the future of parapsychology? What type of new research or opportunities do you think are starting? Well, right now, some colleagues of mine are using artificial intelligence in an attempt to understand parapsychological phenomena better. And there are now a whole range of laboratory techniques and even statistical techniques we didn't have 50 years ago. I think that parapsychology is now on the verge of coming to a better understanding, maybe not a complete understanding, but at least a better understanding of what is going on. Dean Ray and his staff at the Institute of Nobelic Sciences have performed some remarkable experiments, some of them actually involving quantum physics, physics have been getting results strong enough so they can publish their results 
in journals that ordinarily do not publish parapsychological information. I think that people like Bigelow, who put a million and a half dollars into this collection of articles, he had the money and he felt that this would be the best way to spend his money in terms of parapsychology. Fine. I wish that there'd be other millionaires who would come up with the same amount of money and devote it more to experimental research. What was the very first experiment or research you participated in when you were starting out? Long before I worked at the Dream Laboratory, I was at Kent State University, and I worked in our child study center, which I directed, which interviewed children with learning disabilities and suggested therapy for them. And I once had a contest to see which of our students could identify correctly pictures in sealed envelopes. And this is about patience on their part, because just identifying one picture doesn't give you much of anything statistically. They had several, but I said the winner will get a transistor radio. And as a group, they all performed above chance. One of them was quite and identified almost all of the pictures correctly. So he was the one that got the transistor radio. And the article was called Coding and Clairvoyance in an ESP Experiment with Children. And that was published in a drill called Perceptual Motor Skills. And it's in my collection of articles, which are all housed at Rice University in Houston, Texas, along with all the other articles I've ever written. A link to that. Along the way, was there ever a pivotal just, I know you were always, were pretty open to this. Was there anything that just went out of your boundaries that you witnessed that just astounded you that you just thought, how is that even possible? Actually, I've never asked myself that question because from an early age, I said, this is simply the way things are. This is how the world works. You just have to just have to accept it and go on from there. So I've never had that type of a problem. However, my mind has changed over the years, not on parapsychology, but on several other topics. When I was living in New York City, I went to hear Betty Friedan talk about her book, which is one of the first pioneers in women's studies called The Feminine Mystique, completely blew my mind, completely changed my attitude about the world of women in society. Thank heavens I got there early so that I could manifest this for the rest of my career. So that was a, a major change for me. And on another front, and this was also dating back to my years in New York, I was very impressed by a Time Magazine article about the Vietnam War, and they said this is the right war in the right place at the right time. And then I got to New York, began discussing the war with my friends, began watching the news. No, Time Magazine was wrong. This war was wrong from the get-go. And I actually did what I could to start bringing troops home, ending the war, that took several years. And perhaps the major contribution that I made was my conversation with Daniel Ellsberg, author of the Pentagon Papers, and the whistleblower who pointed out that the presidential administration knew that the war was lost, but refused to tell anybody. He almost went to jail for that revelation. And he said, they want me to write a book about the topic. And I just don't know where to start. So I gave him just some basic information. He wrote a wonderful book called Secrets. And at my 70th birthday party, he showed up. And when people told about their experiences with me, he thanked me for helping him write the book. I'd only told one or two people. I kept it a secret. I didn't want to boast or brag or anything. But I appreciated Daniel's comment, knowing, well, all the mistakes I've made in my life, at least I've done a few things right. Realizing about the feminist perspective and the war, I mean, helping humanity is really 
that's so important and understanding and hopefully bettering us as humans as we go along. We have a way to go, but Mm -hmm. whatever you can contribute to that. So are there any final messages you want to leave with our listeners? Yes, my study of dreams has produced something very interesting. When I first started out with Montague Allman, people had dreams about social events such as wars, such as pollution, etc., The psychoanalyst interpreted this, well, this is a battle within the psyche of the dreamer. Mind you, all must know there can be social roots of the dream. They can be actually reflections of what's going on in the world. And you take a look at the data. Dreams about climate change are on the increase, especially among young people. This is a great concern. You take a look at the number of climate dreams, virtually none back when I was growing up. And over the years, they've increased bit by bit by bit by bit. Now, in this survey, some 20 to 25 percent of people who are interviewed have had dreams about climate change and its disastrous effects. And the fact that this has now entered the unconscious of so many people indicates one of the values of dreams. Yes, they can alert us to our personal crises, but they can also alert us to social and environmental crises. So I think this is an encouraging note. Yeah, I've had climate terrors and dreams as well. And hopefully this will maybe, I guess it's the tipping point of do we, hopefully we'll fix it in time is I guess my point. So thank you so much for sharing that. And thank you for your time today. I think this is going to be a really special episode for our listeners. Oh, I hope so. I loved the conversation. So yes, thank you, thank you so much. And hopefully all of you will go learn more about Dr. Krippner, read his books. Where can our listeners find you? Oh, good heavens. They can certainly go to my website, which is stanleycrypter.weebly.com. And they'll have more information than they would ever want to have. And thank you for the excellent questions. You've really done your homework. That means a lot to everybody. To get more information on what the fuck just happened, go to WTFJustHappened.net. There you can order my book, What the Fuck Just Happened? A Sciency Skeptic Explores Grief healing, and evidence of an afterlife. And you can learn all about how I came to conclude that there most likely is an afterlife. You can also learn about the early stages of my grief and the amazing, fascinating people I met along the way. You can also read about how much I harassed them trying to get evidence, see if they were cheating, and see if they were sane. There, you can subscribe to our newsletter. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. It makes such a difference, especially for a new podcast like this one. And if any of you have had a crazy what the fuck yourself, have any questions, feedback, or just want to say hi, reach out on either Instagram at WTF underscore just underscore happened underscore or email me at hello at wtf just happened.net and remember you don't have to draw any final conclusions as you wonder what the fuck just happened